should I distinguish it? Should I put it on top of it? Yeah. Is that on? Is that on? Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me? No, it's not on. Maybe it's on and I'm just not speaking to it. Can everyone hear me over here? Okay, so maybe it is on and I'm just not noticing it because I haven't made it made that weird sound. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for coming here today and joining us for what is a tri-campus event to commemorate our Orange Shirt Day, which is our second annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. My name is Kelly Hannah Moffat and I'm the Vice President of People's Strategy, Equity and Culture and I have the pleasure today of welcoming you and I'm honored to do that. And I'm also going to host a little bit for you today. And I want to thank you for coming here and joining us on behalf of the University of Toronto. It's really important for us to recognize what we're marking today on September 30th. We're marking Orange Shirt Day, and it's an Indigenous-led initiative that was launched in 2013 that takes its name and inspiration from the childhood experiences of Phyllis Webstadt. On her first day of residential school, Phyllis was forced to remove an orange shirt, which was a gift from her grandmother, and wear a school uniform, which was one act of many that was meant to erase her Indigenous identity. Phyllis's story has galvanized communities across Canada to recognize the profound and lasting damage that Canadian residential schools inflicted on Indigenous children, their families, and the generations that followed them. Last year, the Canadian government created the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation to fulfill the call of action number 80 of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation of Canada. That call identified the need to maintain a public memory of Canada's residential schools as part of a reconciliation process. I'm very honored today to acknowledge the presence of the Eagle Feather at today's event. Presented to President Gertler by Andrew Wesley on behalf of the Elder Circle at an entrustment ceremony for the report answering the call, what a hecho win, this feather was a gift to the university. It's a symbol of the university's commitment to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. 
We regret that Andrea is not able to join us today, but we are grateful to have the feather present, reminding us all of this commitment. The eagle is held as sacred by the Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas, and other Indigenous people because it flies closest to the Creator. The eagle feather symbolizes the qualities such as respect, strength, courage, and wisdom. All of that was absent in the decision to establish residential schools across Canada and to sustain this horrific system until the 1990s. Yet, the qualities are top of mind today as we reflect upon the honour of gen the generations of children who attended residential schools, many of who were lost and those who survived. These are qualities, too, that we should strive to embody as we implement the 34 calls to action identified by the University of Toronto's Truth and Reconciliation Steering Committee and to which our institution must remain accountable. Now I want to introduce my colleague Alex Gillespie and I'd like to invite her to come to give us the land acknowledgement. Many of you may know Alex. Alex is our Vice President and Principal at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Alex. It's my great privilege to serve, as you just heard, as a Vice President of the University of Toronto and Principal of the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I'm a Pākehā New Zealander from an English, Scottish and French German colonial family that settled in Whakatū and Te Whanganui Ātara in Aotearoa. Now I work, live and raise my family here on the traditional lands of the Wendat, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation at a meeting place that's home to many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on this land in Toronto, Scarborough, and Mississauga, which stems from relationships formed in Treaties 13 and 13A. And I know that opportunity carries responsibilities embedded in the living history of this place. My family and I live on U of T's Mississauga campus, which looks out over the Missinihi, the Trusting Creek. That's the river that the British called the Credit, because at its mouth they traded goods on credit with indigenous peoples who had traveled and cared for its waters and shores for thousands of years. That history animates our place today, as the University of Toronto aims to build a community worthy of trust and to earn the opportunity to learn from and with Indigenous peoples. It also informs our commitment to be kind and true in all our relations, including as we share sincere, sincere support for the James Smith Cree Nation and honour and grieve Indigenous lives taken through the residential schools. Chi Magretch to the Office of Indigenous Initiatives for the invitation to join today's event and stand with you in truth. And Magretch too to Indigenous colleagues and community for the friendship they show to the University of Toronto as we work to realise the responsibilities of this land, to answer the calls to action of Wichi Hedewin and to live a good life together. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to guess that was Michael. <laughs> People are nodding. Um, so before we move to our keynote speaker by Brenda Wessakut, it's important to acknowledge the collaborative efforts that made this event responsible. The Office of Indigenous Initiative worked in partnership with First Nations House and Hart House, who also sponsored the event. This group of individuals is deeply committed and has worked tremendously hard. And I'm very proud of what they've been accomplishing throughout the year. And I think this is also a moment to sort of reflect and think about the hard work that they do and our responsibility to support them. But I also want to say thank you for all the work that each of them have done to make today's event possible. Also, we've had the Orange Shirt Steering Committee, which included staff, students, and faculty representatives from across the campuses and they also devoted many hours to today's event to make it possible and to ensure that it went smoothly. And I want to thank all of them also for their contributions. I would also like to give a very special thanks to the Office of Indigenous Initiatives led by Shannon Simpson 
for sponsoring our tri-campus work to fulfill the university's 34 calls to action. This office provides guidance to campuses, faculties, and units who are the making the necessary changes to affirm Indigenous ways of knowing and doing in their physical spaces, their policies, and their activities. These changes ensure that Indigenous students, staff, and faculty, as well as librarians, both current and prospective, can feel a sense of belonging to the university. The Office of Indigenous Initiatives supports the personal training, the journeys, and learnings of non-Indigenous communities, as well as offering courses that build knowledge and understanding about Indigenous culture, histories, and current issues affecting Indigenous communities. And I strongly urge all non-Indigenous students, faculty, librarians, and staff to recognize and accept their personal responsibilities for making change happen at this university and to advance reconciliation through both your words and your actions. I also encourage you to reach out and consult with the Office of Indigenous Initiatives as you facilitate events, support new programs and initiatives, and help to modify the policies and practices within your own campuses or units. Making a lifelong commitment to building a relationship and engaging with Indigenous people at and beyond the university community. It's critical that we work with our Indigenous colleagues and partners. And with that, I would like to introduce one of our keynote speakers, or sorry, actually, I'm not going to introduce a keynote speaker. I'm going to actually welcome Giselle Devai, a second year psychology health sciences student at UTSC, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks. Sagon uh, Tanse, um, Brenda Wistuskut is Cree from Churchill, Manitoba. She is a mother, grandmother, and great-great-aunt of the West Tiscut and Brightnose family. Their roots begin from the York Factory Fur Trading Post flowing south along the Hudson Bay Railway to Winnipeg. Currently, Dr. West Tiscut teaches at the University of Toronto, where she resides in Toronto. She consults with the arts and science faculty members to better reflect the historic and truth and to open doors to reconciliation. Dr. West Tiscut's doctoral dissertation titled Showing and Telling the Story of Nikki's Arts-Based Autoethnographic Journeying of a Cree Adult Educator and Telling the Stories from a Memory Map of Her Childhood, Home in the 1960s, She Exposes the Impacts of the Residential School Policy. Now, uh, welcome Brenda. And say, uh, hello everyone. Can you hear me talking? Can move it closer. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming here today and wearing orange shirts and, uh, and, and ribbon skirts when you could. This is the first time I'm wearing a ribbon skirt my daughter made. My daughter is here. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, um, I guess I have a set of slides that uh, are going to be shown here. And uh, I'm going to tell this story about this little house. It's uh, a Cree word is negus, negus. It means my little house. And uh, I wanted to talk about this house because it tells the story of uh, what happened to my family. I'm the youngest of 11, and all my siblings, they all went to residential school. And I was the only one who didn't go. And so I stayed home with my mom and dad, and we waited for my brothers and sisters to come home every summer. And so that's when I saw them in the summer. And so I was, for most of the year, I was the only uh, child in my home with my, my parents. So I, I talk about this, uh, it's the time of the 1960s. Uh, I, you can't hear? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to start yelling then. <laughs> um, 
I'm usually a lot louder when I'm teaching a class, but uh, uh, right now I'm kind of, I guess they're doing this wiring here. Okay, let me start with this poem. This is a poem to honor my mother, Mariah. The old woman sits by her window overlooking the Hudson Bay. Seagulls swirl through the salty air. Their lonesome cries pierce the wind. Alone, she sits working beads on to hide. Her dress of flowers red and gold tell of her happiest times of old. Her eyes glance now and then at the television. It might be Sesame Street or Curious George or a silly soap opera. It's all the same to her. Its noise fills the room where her husband and children once hurried about. The old woman sits rocking and humming, not a streak of gray in her hair. Memories visit her as she sips her tea. She remembers how things used to be, of how her mother worked quills on to hide and guided babies into the world. She says, <laughs> oh my God, good Lord. Okay. We're starting with a bang here this morning. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you for your help. Uh, she remembers how things used to be, of how her mother worked quills on to hide and guided babies into the world and passed away quietly, like a t leaving only, and like a tossed pebble, leaving only a ripple in the great pond of life. I, I wrote this poem for my mother when she passed in 1996. And uh, she was a, a very beautiful, amazing woman who provided stability throughout the many years of chaos in our lives. She was the woman that uh, her sisters would come and visit and tell all their problems to. She, would never, she was never judgmental. She was always just listening and very caring and loving. And that's who my role model was. And uh, that's who I wanted to, to, to honor here today. I don't have a button to press these slides, so who's pressing the slides? Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask the ancestors to uh, be with us today to help us to take care of ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, help us be kind to each other today, and to think well of each other, and to understand that many people uh, continue to suffer and they, they continue to suffer alone. Even our young people, you know, our young people uh, who've never uh, been to residential school, but they are the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of survivors, and they see the suffering in their, their, their parents and their grandparents, and they carry that weight often alone. So uh, be with us today, uh, ancestors. So this is just a map, it just shows where I'm, where I'm, holy smokes. <laughs> I think the trickster's here today. <laughs> uh, okay, are you, are you ready? <laughs> uh, so that's where I'm from at the top of the map, it says Churchill. And uh, if you read any of the reports in the uh, TRC, uh, website. There's a, a story by, um, I think it was Larry Beardy. He's a survivor of residential schools and he wrote about the train of tears. And you can see we're at the very top at Churchill. That's where they would pick up the children. Oh wow, I can hear myself. <laughs> Maybe it's too loud now. Uh, and they would pick up children there at Churchill, Manitoba uh, to go to residential school and then the train would go down the track all the way down to Dauphin. And each time they would pick up more children, uh, they would all start crying again. And then they would have to calm down the little ones and then they'd pick up another uh, family of children. 
a lot of the Native people lived along the Bay Line and they maintained the Bay Line for many years that it operated. And uh, before we moved to Churchill, my dad was one of the uh, men that worked for the CNR Railway and he, he um, the, my, my uh, siblings that went away to residential school before I was born, they would come home to a different place along that railway. So that railway was where a lot of Native people lived. And I just want to get some of this water. Okay. So this is what I decided to do for my thesis. <clears throat> I decided to use art to tell a story. Um, mostly because, you know, my family, we didn't have any photographs. So I had to draw everything from memory. And uh, I wanted to show where it was that I uh, lived in the 60s and some of the things that happened there. And so that's the drawing of my, my house. And then uh, I drew this picture, it uh, has broken windows. And I wanted to show uh, the kind of uh, social climate at the time, there was a lot of alcoholism in my community. And there was, what came with that was violence. And uh, my house in the summers would often look like that. It would get uh, beaten up. Uh, my siblings would come home, and as they got older, you know, they would take it out on this house. And so that's why you'd see uh, a lot of houses with broken windows. And uh, I was reading this study over here in the criminology library uh, of somebody who came up to Churchill, and, you know, her intentions were very good. She wanted to help but she didn't really understand the, the depth of the situation. And she did this uh, summer project where she helped people fix their windows. And, you know, she'd buy the window panes and the putty and stuff like that. And she showed them how to do it. And then they would break them again. And she'd be like, how could they break them again? I just, we fixed them and it costs this much. And, you know, she'd be really frustrated. And she didn't understand that it was way beyond uh, the windows and that it was a historic problem that was set in so many, probably 150 years before, <laughs> you know. But I was reading her study because it showed that a lot of the crimes jumped for the, into the, like the summer months was when, when most of the, when my siblings would be home, <laughs> you know. So here's a poem about uh, window panes. As a child, I peered into the window panes, um, I peered into the windows of my house to see who was there and who was absent. Siblings home, siblings gone, looking for my mom or dad to see if who was there was sober or drunk to see if it was safe to enter my house. How do you know if it is safe to enter your own house? There is daylight. The night of drinking is over. The table is upright with all of the chairs. The radio is playing, the lamp in its place on the wall. The water barrel is upright and the floor is dry. The smell of food cooking. Mom is home. The stove is filled with fire and the house is warm. But when looking through a busted window, through shattered glass, what does it mean? Pane glass windows, window pane, pain. One could see from a distance our broken pieces. A broken family has shattered windows, missing pieces of glass, Frag fragments which may never be found again. Window pane, pain. And so I started uh, doodling. It was very hard work, the doodling. <laughs> uh, 
I, really, I just was trying to figure out a way in to this huge uh, um, story that was often overwhelming and painful to look at. And uh, I didn't have a lot of, um, like I, I wasn't, I was journaling at times, but I, I was trying to figure out how, was, how am I gonna do this in an academic way, in an academic setting, and be considered an academic, and I'm bringing all this pain with me. And uh, so I just started doodling. And my professor, my advisor, uh, Jean-Paul Restoul, he said, well, let me see your doodles, <laughs> because I wasn't uh, writing regularly, you know. And so he looked at that uh, piece of paper, and he said, oh, it's a mom holding a baby. And uh, I hadn't tried to create a mom holding a baby. <laughs> and I think it was my mom saying, this is what you need to look at. You know, this is what's happened to us. There's been, you know, thousands of children ripped away from their mother. And that has been the greatest assault on a people. And that's been the, the longest lasting injury to us. And so the next uh, slide. So then I called it a mother's embrace. And it really does look like my mother holding a baby and she's sitting on the floor. And she would often sit on the floor too uh, when she was plucking geese. She would sit there like that. And uh, one of the lines on to the right that says, if this was my thesis, would you read it? <laughs> uh, so, Writing begins in many ways. It, it's not just one way. You can find your own way in to a, your, your story that you want to tell. And that's another drawing of my house in the flats. It was outside the town of Churchill, Manitoba. And um, so, this is what I drew from memory. That black box in the front there, that was a coal bin. Sometimes I slept in there. Sometimes I was partying and fighting and there was nowhere safe to sleep. Uh, so I would climb in that coal bin and sleep in there on top of all the coal. And um, I looked at this, this photograph, this, this drawing, I wasn't really sure why I put that bluebird there. Uh, I showed this story around all different places across Toronto, and, and I, I went to uh, Unigratz, Austria as well, and uh, people would ask, why is that bluebird there? You know, they figured it was some sort of cultural significance. And I honestly, I didn't know why it was there for a while. For a long time, I didn't know why I put that there. And then I decided that, uh, that was my helper, and he was helping me not to fall back into that, all that pain and trauma. And so, and here's a, there's a yellow line around him, so he has a, uh, the, the day of, the, the daylight, bring in the daylight. Okay. So this drawing uh, is really, um, a truth-telling drawing because it shows how I would go and see off my siblings at the train station and they would leave on that train. And it's, on the train it says brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. You can even say parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, generations of children taken and uh, the tracks is very deeply embedded into the land across our country and was placed there for a reason. And by the way, my daughter drew the tracks for me. <laughs> uh, and it says goodbye station because that's where I went to say goodbye. Uh, trains. 
The trains rumble by under our feet, under layers of concrete, as we students sit in a classroom on the second floor. We resist the sound of clicking and clacking each time it passes. We strain to listen to her words, hope to hear the wisdom, hope to be inspired. We struggle to find our place, but the trains will not go away. Their rumble is steady, persistent, undeniable. Their rumbles and their squeals will not be ignored. It is the train from my past that has arrived. Their trains haunt me as I look ahead. It calls me to look back. A child's face on a child's body stands on the station platform, slowly disappears as the train pulls away. Her heart is breaking. Who is that child? Why is she being left behind? Trains take people away. Trains return them to their families. And I was taking an arts-informed course with uh, Ar Ardra Cole. We were on the second floor at Oise, and all you can hear is those trains down under the ground. And, uh, you know, I started um, connecting to that uh, little girl that often felt abandoned. And so there, there are many of us like that who didn't go to residential school and saw off our siblings and were left behind to contend with the aftermath, you know, uh, the alcoholism, the violence. I said the poverty of the flats. And, um, okay. And that's my community there. Uh, that's where I grew up. The Flats was a, a little village of Native people, and we couldn't afford the, the rent in town, so everybody built themselves a little house down there in the Flats, just on the other side of the tracks by the Churchill River. And uh, that's where I lived my first 10 years of life until we moved to town, <laughs> which is a whole other story. I'll have to write that next time. Okay, we'll just skip past that one. So that's the memory map I did, and it, uh, it's an outline of all the furniture that was in my little house. And with each piece of furniture, I wrote memories and uh, stories of each piece that came to mind. And from that, I started telling these stories in public. All of, I just got invited wherever across Toronto different organizations and uh, did workshops with people who created their own memory maps. And I worked with uh, all Indigenous groups as well as non-Indigenous groups. Some groups were mixed and um, people came out with their stories about what it was like to grow up uh, where they did. And uh, yeah, so it was okay. And that's the Churchill uh, station, train station. Anybody ever been to Churchill, Manitoba? Oh my goodness, hello. <laughs> uh, that's just one person? Oh, oh my, there's more. Okay, well, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to show this photo which I found on the internet. And it shows how families loved their children. Indigenous families love their children. That's one thing you can, if you can remember from today is that we love our children. Always have loved our children. We've never stopped loving our families and children. It's important to keep that in mind always because a lot of the uh, ideas that are um, perpetuated are, are not, not really true, or it is, it's, the fact is that our culture is that we love our children, and our experience is that we've been divided from our children. And so those are two very different things. So families tried to stay as close to their children as possible, and they would camp out by these schools 
to, to see their children and get be close to them because they love them. And then uh, the Indian Act uh, uh, amended laws to create this divide and said, you can't come visit your kids because you're teaching them the language. You're teaching them their culture and we're trying to erase that. And so then you can see in the next, oh, okay, sorry, it's further down, but this is a, the letters that my dad wrote, my, my siblings, and uh, he would always say, uh, uh, we kiss you 10 times. And uh, he sent it to the oldest, uh, my, the bro my brother who was the oldest, and he was expected to kiss the younger siblings, you know, for, for my parents. And I think there's just two more slides like that. And then the next one. Okay. Oh, that's the stove. Um, I was just showing that we, the kind of foods that we ate was a rabbit. Anybody have rabbits? <laughs> uh, okay, the next one. Oh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this, um, the experience of sexual abuse, which has become um, too common and it has never been our culture to abuse our children. And this has been our experience. That's what I was trying to explain in, in my thesis is that uh, this uh, pattern of, of sexual abuse was introduced to our, our people. And uh, it was never something that we practiced in any way as a culture. And so in early social work degrees, uh, early social work writing, the, this was a myth, you know, that they, they were, uh, that has to be uh, um, corrected. <clears throat> this just shows uh, the vulnerable places that children were placed in, in these schools. water barrel. My um, oldest sister, my, one of my sisters got typhoid from our water in the flats and uh, three other native girls that summer got typhoid and this made the news. I was able to find that article in the newspaper. Uh, broken windows. Okay, maybe swing past that. I'm trying to get to, uh, okay. So in, the, in this writing that I did, uh, I actually wrote seven chapters. It is an academic thesis, uh, and uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, at times very uh, painful, you know, and I had uh, some really key support people here in, at the University of Toronto from First Nations House, and uh, Lee Miracle was on my side. <laughs> And uh, I'm thankful uh, for people like her who said, this is academic. <laughs> and she said, Rrr, you know, like she, she really, <laughs> she told them, you know. And, uh, you know, she just encouraged me to, you know, come out with my language, use my language and speak my language. That's academic, she said, it's as academic as, as Greek and, you know, uh, all those other languages. Okay. So there were some very good memories and the fact that I had uh, two aunts in my community who had daughters and we all hung out together, we all slept together, we ate together, we walked to school together, we walked home, <laughs> uh, we played together pretty much every day. I mean, we were attached at the hip. And, um, you know, we survived everything together. And if I didn't have them there, I don't know that I would have survived really. And uh, I'm still thankful to them to this day. They're very much my sisters. Yeah. Okay. And then you see now the picture of where there's no parents around. And it's just the children. 
So it was a very deliberate, strategic uh, uh, um, law. These laws were, were amended to the Indian Act to divide our, our, our families and to remove parents' control, parents' influence, parents' love. So there's the actual photo of my house that was uh, provided by the Winnipeg Tribune. It was taken in 1968 in February, and uh, guess where I found it? Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it was in uh, the Churchill group, and they said, hey, Brenda, look at this is your house. And I had been looking for it for a long time. And so this is how they used to do research. Indigenous research was just drive by there, take a photo, and take off. <laughs> That's what happened. They, they came up in a truck, they came out, and they jumped in their vehicle, and they took off. And so there was never any kind of uh, you know, consent or permission asked. Uh, there was no partnerships in the research. You know, um, back then, the news media was also like that. I was watching news one evening, uh, the weather and stuff. I mean, there was only one channel, so you had to watch every, everything that CBC did. And um, it was called 24 Hours. And it was uh, the weather. And here they were filming my mom and dad. You know, they, they were drunk. And they were falling down. My mother had fallen in the snow, and he, my dad was trying to help her. You know, so these, and then you go up to school the next day and they're like, hi, I saw your mom and dad, they were drunk. You know, they're just drunks. And, and so this kind of um, image was what I had to uh, try to, uh, you know, cope with as, as a child and try to still feel worthy of, of some kind of respect, you know, and kindness. And uh, you know there was there was a lot of stuff like that growing up in the 60s. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention was that um, there was a lot of violence on our women. You know, uh, my mother was was beaten up by my, my dad, and the other aunties were beaten up by their husbands. And uh, when I looked out at some of my older cousins, they often would have slash marks up their arms. You know. My mother would have a black eye, and these were the kinds of uh, injuries that came in on us. And there would be, at times, on a Friday night, there would be a carload of guys coming from town, you know, and they would grab a girl and they would rape her. You know, this is the kind of violence that I was uh, trying to survive and trying to... Uh, um, I really became very bleak and I was really starting to feel like I, I probably won't survive this. I probably won't grow up. It was getting very uh, hopeless back then. So that's the rubble that stood there at Brandon Indian Residential School for a long time. Uh, they had torn down the school there because there was vandalism and, and uh, uh, people were breaking all the windows and stuff. And so I went to this mound of rubble, and one day I found this door on, the, on top of it. It was a steel door, which was very difficult to, to lift. Opening the steel door, I think of my, mother, my brother's small hand trying to open this door. It is heavy too heavy for a child to open. This door opens to sadness, to loneliness, to cold, hard concrete spaces, to more vulnerable places. His Cree voice crying, Niwi Giwan, I want to go home, would not have been heard through this thick steel door. My grandmother's self wants to reach back in time and open this steel door for him. Sadly, that is impossible. 
All I can do is light a candle and say a prayer for his safe journey home. Back to our ancestors and the loving arms of mom and dad. Um, my, my brother uh, Frank, who was the youngest of, the, of the, my siblings that went to residential school, and uh, when he got his compensation money, he got a lot of money because he was abused in so many different ways. I, I never knew you could be abused in those ways. And uh, so he got a huge amount of money. And because he was a drinker, he went drinking. That's what he did. Other people did other things, but that's what he did. And he was seen in the bars uh, with a lot of money. And people followed him out, out of the bar that night. At closing time, everybody left the bar and they followed him down a back lane. And, they, you know, he died. He was killed. Um, so he never really got to enjoy any of this compensation, any of this uh, uh, money, though he had plans. Because he never could find the healing that he really needed. And, and uh, there's so many, um, there's so many people like that in my family alone, just in my family, uh, you know, that continue to suffer and need, need help. And there's just not enough places. There's not enough listeners, you know. Okay. So that's when the queen came to Churchill. I added a little story like this because um, in 1970, the queen came to Churchill and they were trying to plan her route where her car would go, you know. And uh, everybody agreed that she shouldn't see the flats. Oh, no, no, it was terrible. She couldn't see that. But we could live there, you know. But anyway, I was thinking, but what if she came to the flats? What if she came to our house and had tea with my mom? There's my mom on the right side there. And, uh, you know, I was just playing with this idea and uh, I guess kind of trying to find some humor uh, because our stories are often painful, but there's also some very funny stories. And she would probably have a royal taste tester to taste the tea. <laughs> well, they probably have special water brought in because they would want her to get typhoid. And... Uh, you know, there'd probably be a whole fanfare, like maybe even uh, fiddlers. I can imagine, uh, uh, you know, a quartet <laughs> of fiddlers and uh, jigging and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, the queen came to Churchill and, and all the Indians went to town with posters. You know, we were going to tell her. And I always ask my students, what do you think the posters said? And uh, a lot of times students will say, go home. <laughs> and I say, we would never dare tell the queen to go home because we'd probably be jailed. Um, but the posters said, affordable housing now. Safe housing now. We're still saying that. How many years later? Still need housing now. Uh, that doesn't uh, burn up. Like my house itself, it burnt down twice. You know, our houses would burn down quite often. Okay. And just more of that, the, the rubble at the Brandon Indian School. The mound of rubble. And I think I'm near the end now. Uh, just maybe the next one. Okay, one more. So this is my mom and dad. And uh, I was telling this story in the church one time on uh, King Street. I was invited there by, by uh, the church. 
And uh, at the end, when I got to this slide, that feather at the bottom, it was glowing blue. And they were just really, I didn't even notice it. There was somebody in the audience that said, look, it's glowing blue, you know, and everybody was, uh, I guess they took it as some kind of message from God or some kind of miracle or something. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of the blue bird that was in the, the earlier drawing and how that blue bird is there to help, to help me tell the story, you know, so I don't uh, stand up here and be crying the whole time, <laughs> you know. So I'll close with this poem. Conveyance. Seeing my village down the flats through my eyes. Hearing the pain through my words. Feeling all the emotions from my storytelling I convey to you. The experience of a child left behind so many years ago. Lost in the many legs of mums and dads, first walking, then running as the train pulls away. To wave one last wave to their children, faces pushing against windows, leaving steadily, drifting further and further down the tracks. Tears run down my face. I come to know the times for goodbye and the times for greeting them again. I was there. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Oh, okay. All oh, right. <laughs> That's right. You might have questions. Yes. So, uh, on my name is John Monahan. I'm the warden of Hart House, and on behalf of everyone here. Brenda, we want to thank you very sincerely for uh, sharing your truth with us today. Uh, on today of all days, um, it is extremely generous of you to share your memories and your wisdom and your knowledge with us. And your generosity continues because you have agreed to uh, take a, a few questions from us this morning. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, so if there are people that have questions, uh, I'd invite you to raise your hand. We have uh, mic runners that can bring the microphone to you. Uh, is there anyone that would like to ask a question of Brenda before? Is that a question there? Oh, yes, sorry. So if, if anyone is hesitant to stand up and ask a question, we do have cards and <laughs> pens available. So there are people there with cards and pens as well. Um, is there someone... So you can also make a comment. Oh, yes. There you go. Here's right in the middle. Can you just wait for the mic to come to you? Oh, OK. This isn't, sorry. This isn't a question. This is a comment. But I just wanted to say thank you so very much for sharing your experiences. It's, you, thank you. There's a question over here. We're thinking of those people joining us virtually, and they appreciate your patience while we wait to pass the microphone to you. Those people joining us virtually. <laughs> Much. Um, my question was, how did you escape going to the residential schools? Maybe you already answered that, but the sound wasn't too great to the, in the beginning. So how did you not? Well, How did you escape the horror? Yeah. There were families who hid their children. You know, and that's how a lot of our, our ceremonies were preserved and were, were kept alive. You know, ceremonies survived all that by hiding their children. I wasn't one of those children. I was at about school age, 
late 60s, uh, the federal government was uh, getting rid of their control of Indian education and they were passing it on to provinces to take over, make those decisions for themselves as provinces. And in Manitoba, they decided that uh, it was no longer compulsory to attend residential school. And so any family could choose to send their kids to public school around there. I mean, it was no longer compulsory to attend residential school. Did I say that? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was one of the reasons is the policies are changing. Is there anyone else? Okay. Do you want to bring this, the card up? There's a lady there. Hello, and thank you. I'd like to ask, is there an opportunity to view and engage with your thesis work? Um, at it's a, a later point? Yes, it's available online. You can just Google uh, that title, um, Negus. What is it called? Showing and telling the story of Negus. Uh, arts-based, autoethnographic, such a long title, uh, journey of a uh, adult, pre-adult education educator. <laughs> Brenda, here's a question from uh, someone in the audience. Do you have any thoughts for Indigenous students who are struggling in the university system today? Yes, I think of them all the time. Uh, I teach courses that, um, you know, I'm trying to be very thoughtful of uh, Indigenous students and to help them find their own voice and their own way to uh, doing their studies and doing their research and uh, also providing a list of support services that are available here on campus, which are very, like, um, if you come to First Nation House, you're going to come home. You're going to come to your people and your family. Sorry. I want to mention um, that for those of you who are Indigenous today, uh, we understand this uh, is a very solemn and perhaps a very difficult day. Uh, there is uh, the, the Indigenous Students Association has a garden. Uh, where sacred medicines are maintained. Uh, it Michael is White. He's in charge of that garden. Michael. Yeah, Michael. Did, well, yeah, so, so he knows what I'm going to say. Oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a fire uh, being lit today that will, that will uh, be burning oh, for those from the indigenous community to gather for, uh, for community and a time of, uh, of uh, reflection and togetherness. And uh, if you want, upon leaving this room, the garden is very close, but a little bit tricky to find. You, would, you could follow Michael White, uh, or you can go out the side doors here, turn left, turn left again, and the garden is just it's on Queens Park, here. just behind here, mm -hmm. just north of our parking lot. So that's for those in the indigenous community. I encourage you to consider that. Um, I also want, again, to extend our collective thanks to Brenda, who has a very long day ahead of her. Uh, she is, for those of you that are fortunate enough to live in or near Richmond Hill, she is the keynote presenter this evening at Richmond Hill's uh, Performing Arts Center, uh, where she is sharing her reflections and work and memories uh, again. So. Uh, uh, we are deeply, deeply grateful, Brenda, to you for being with us today. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to say just a few words to wrap up. Should I use the hand mic or the, that one's fine. Um, uh, I'm in my last two weeks as warden at Hart House uh, and I'm um, just really grateful and honored uh, that, that we have been able to gather this morning here, that you have come to this space. And for those of you that don't know, this space did not always look like this. 
It's still a fairly colonial space, I think you would agree. But on the north wall, uh, there's a sculpture that has hung here since 2019. And if you'll forgive my poor attempt at pronouncing Anishinaabe Moen, the name is Wabadizian Dopwening, or to see yourself at the table. This is a sculpture by Rebecca Belmore and Osvaldo Yero. And we placed it there in honor of our 100th anniversary in 2019. For those that are not able to see the wall, uh, because you're joining us on video and you're probably, unfortunately, looking at me and not the wall, uh, it is quite large. It has the same dimensions as the traditional dining room tables around which generations of students have gathered for meals in the Great Hall here. Uh, the sculpture is covered in highly polished aluminum and it invites the viewer to consider who is present at the table and who is missing. Wabadizian dopwining. It invites everyone who enters this room to see themselves and their identities, their communities and stories reflected in this space and in all the spaces of the university. And to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, they belong here. And if they do not see themselves, the sculpture challenges the viewers to ask why that is and to work to address that exclusion. Because it is, of course, only after everyone has arrived and taken their rightful seat at the table that the feasting can truly begin. And who doesn't love a feast? But until that moment, we are incomplete. So being at the table is essential, but that is not sufficient. There are obviously historical wrongs and current wrongs, power imbalances, resource inequities all across Canada, and that includes the University of Toronto and they need to be acknowledged and addressed. And I was thinking about that the other day as I was walking across campus and I saw the signs for Defy Gravity, you know, the new, uh, the current uh, advancement campaign for the university. And as a non-Indigenous person, I began thinking, how can I defy gravity? And I would challenge myself and others who are non-Indigenous the next time we see those words to think very intentionally about how we can defy gravity in our relationships with Indigenous students and colleagues and community. How we can lighten the unrelenting load that we have together placed on the backs of our Indigenous colleagues and friends and students by asking them to do far too much of the heavy lifting towards achieving conciliation between us and them. And how can we counter the weightiness of history with the lightness of justice and compassion and kindness? How can we refuse to be complicit any longer in blindly supporting systems and policies that were expressly designed to weigh down Indigenous peoples so that we, non-Indigenous peoples, could lift ourselves up? How can we, nearly 100,000 brilliant minds here at the University of Toronto, come together to defy the gravitational pull of discrimination and indifference and commit ourselves to realizing a near present where Indigenous students and staff and faculty and community are welcome and honoured and equal participants at each and every table. Let's defy gravity together. Today may be an emotionally difficult day for many, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and so to all those who are gathered, I encourage you to be kind to yourselves as Brenda encouraged you to do. Be kind to one another. After you leave here, perhaps, perhaps if you have time, go for coffee or tea with a friend to think or talk about what you've heard. If you are a student and you feel the need or you want to access mental health supports or services, please consider uh, visiting the student mental health resource at mentalhealth.utoronto.ca. If you are a staff or faculty member, please reach out to your local human resources office or to your employee assistance provider. If you're someone who, who recognizes you need to know more about the Indigenous community, or if you yourself are an Indigenous person and you would, need to, and you would like to know more about your community here at the university, I invite you to begin by visiting the university's Indigenous Gateway at indigenous.utoronto.ca. And so, as our commemoration has come to a close and we leave with our thoughts, I would encourage us to continue to honour and give thanks for those who survived residential schools 
and may we never forget those who never returned. Thank you all for coming. Miigwech, Miawen, Merci, Marci Cho, Nakurnik. Goodbye. Thank you.